I said, I love you, Kelly. And she said, I want you to listen to me kill myself. And I did. Jack Nance is among my favorite actors of all time. Now, um, my list is a little weird, I admit. Uh, bear with me. On said list are other greats like Peter Green, Taylor Negron, Crispin Glover, Corey Feldman, Tom Cruise, Chris Penn, um, just to name a few. Now, what, what, what do all those guys have in common? Um, well... Some are, I guess, considered character actors, or what have you, while some are A-listers. Now, in my opinion, all of these actors, though, remain underappreciated in Hollywood. Now, that goes for Tom Cruise as well. Sometimes talent is overshadowed by madness. And unfortunately, that comes in many forms. If you aren't familiar with Jack Nance, and I feel not enough people are, you know, I won't go into his entire amazing, sad life and, you know, his accomplishments and everything. A fellow YouTuber, Master of Macabre, did a great job on that. And if you can get your hands on a copy, David Lynch produced the amazing documentary, I Don't Know Jack. Next Step Studios presents a unique documentary about a real character, Jack Nance, the actor who became a cult icon with Eraserhead. His particular type of hair would just lock in. And everybody said, no, no, that's ridiculous. That's absurd. Look at this. And But it was just so beautiful and perfect. I've actually seen it before, and it's quite the documentary, but good luck finding it. What I wanted to do tonight is shed some more light on Jack and, you know, talk about him a little more. Um, using some clips from that I found online and stuff like that. And also resurrecting an old clip from Staunch on Film Number 4 which focused on the film Meatballs 4. All of these interviews and such, you know, they'll be linked in the description. So for those who aren't too familiar with Jack Nance, But I can tell you my dog is always with me. So I did three pictures with Jack Nance, and he was one of the most wonderful human beings I've ever met. Um, we did uh, Meatballs Part 4, we did Voodoo, and Little Witches. So I would jump in the car and I would pick up Jack and I would drop him off. And, and on one day in particular, we're driving to work, and, and Jack, there's no secret, he, he drank. On this particular day, uh, he was not drinking during our show, he's very professional, and, and he. I mean, I can't tell you how professional he was. He was. And I loved him. I mean, like a brother, I loved him. Um, it's a long story. I'll give you the, the, the big beats, So, uh, When we're shooting the movie, um, somewhere a couple of weeks into the shoot, um, we had to shut down production because it was raining really hard. I mean, really hard. There were sheets of rain up in the mountains. And I'm in my bungalow, so we had canceled shooting for the day, and I'm in my bungalow, and everyone is in theirs, I guess, and uh, there's a knock on my door, and I go answer it, and it's Jack. And I look at him, I go, yo, what's out? You know, and he goes, um, I think my wife just killed herself. Now, knowing, knowing Jack, you know, I keep a very loosey-goosey fun set. We play pranks at each other and jokes and everything. So when he said, I think my wife killed my, herself, I said, well, being married to you, Jack, who could blame her? You know, and when I said that, I saw a tear come down his eye and it wasn't the rain. And I was like, oh, man, come on in. So he came in and I said, what's up? And he explained to me that he was talking to his wife, uh, Kelly Van Dyke, who was the daughter of Jerry Van Dyke. Who, Jerry's the brother of Dick Van Dyke. Um, and um, they had been married. They met apparently in AA years before and they got married. And they were talking on the phone, and he, she apparently had slipped into the world of pretty heavy drugs again, and she was uh, doing porno movies. And um, 
he, he couldn't stand it. He was trying to keep straight. He was straight, but he was trying to keep himself on, on the good side, and he didn't need that anymore. So he, they were talking on the phone, and he was basically breaking up the marriage with her on the phone. And she said to him, and he said, look, that's enough. I'm going to hang up now or whatever. And she said, Jack, if you hang up on me, I'm going to, I'm going to kill myself. And Jack um, was saying, you're nuts. Don't do this, blah, 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 blah. And like I said, it was raining real hard. Suddenly the phone went dead. Not because Jack hung up on her. He didn't. The storm knocked the line out. So she had to think that he hung up on her. So he came to me and, and he's coming. He's, the reason he came to me was, is your phone work? I need to call her back. And I checked my phone and it was dead. And I'm going, oh, this is not good. So we got in, we raced out into my rental car and we went to the local town, which is about a half mile from us real quick looking for phones at work. All the phones were dead. We drove around. We went to a fire station in the middle of the forest. There's a fire station. And um, it, it was closed. No firemen there. So we finally found a police station. And we go in there and I explain the situation. They all knew us because they knew we were doing the movie up there at the time. And uh, the, their phones were working. They contacted LAPD to explain the situation because I told them what was happening. So they called LAPD and I'm, I'm sitting there with Jack, with my arm around Jack, just holding on to him, listening to him, just sobbing about, I hope she's okay, I hope she's okay, whatever. And maybe about 10, 15 minutes go by and it was just the one cop that was in the substation there. And the phone rings and the cop answers and he talks for a second. Then he looks at me and he goes like this. He looks at me and he goes, I go, wow. He walks on over to us and he looks at, he looks at Jack and he goes, um, I hate saying this, but she didn't make it. She had hung herself. Uh, um, LAPD had contacted, you know, paramedics and so forth, and they went to her place and uh, found her. And um, I felt, the, I felt, I'm not a religious guy at all, I'm a total atheist, but I mean, I felt like his soul disappear from him. I just felt a drain from his body as I'm holding on to him. And he, he went, he just shattered. Um, okay. Jack was gone for about six days. Um, to uh, to bury his wife. Th that night that he left, that same you know day that it all happened, it was one of the longest nights of my life because I had to go through everything we had shot in two weeks with him, because I had to write him out of the story now. Okay, I can't. I'm not going to have him anymore. So it was a combination of looking at the script and then looking at what we had shot and how can I rewrite it to get him out of the story. It was the longest night of my life. And I did it somehow or another. And the next day we started shooting again. So we shot for six days. And then I get a call from Linda Francis, who's our casting director, a terrific casting director. And she says, Bobby, Jack wants to come back and finish the movie because it would not be professional. Well, now we had shot six more days without him and I had rewritten everything without him. So that night again, I had, because Jack was coming the next day, I had to write him back in again. Taking into taking into consideration everything we had shot again without him, and the story changes. So he comes back the next day, and this is where I'll sum up the story. Uh, in in the Meatballs movie, he has a granddaughter named Kelly uh, that he loved and was just trying to save the camp for her for her future and whatever and all like that. Well, I named the character Kelly after my daughter Kelly. I have a real life daughter named Kelly Kelly Cameron Logan. And, uh, but Jack's wife was named Kelly also. And the very first scene he had to shoot when he came back was the scene where he has to, he, he pours his heart out and apologizes to Kelly for screwing everything up. Tomorrow morning, I'm closing the camp. I have no choice the mortgage and, and all these refunds. It's simply too much to handle. Son, I want to thank you for everything you've done for us. 
You brought back an awful lot of good memories. Kelly, sweetheart, forgive me. Oh, I'm... <laughs> that was a tough scene. There wasn't a dry eye on the set when we shot that. And that's what happened. Um, he came back. Jack was a professional. He didn't want to leave production hanging, so he came back to finish the movie. And he did not. I never let him know all the stuff I had to go through to do it. But what am I going to say to him? No, sorry, Jack, you were gone, and I had to write you out. Couldn't have done that to the man. Anyway, that's the story, and it was. Jack was a pro. Jack was a professional, and he was a great guy and a good friend. And. Uh, so sad, you know, his life ended, you know, not too long, a few years later on. Uh, so anyway, Jack was a good guy. Corey Feldman, who worked on two films with him, that being Meatballs 4 and The Amazing Voodoo, well, he had this to say about his good friend Jack. He would tell me all these stories about how he was messed up and he had done so much work with David Lynch. He said, literally, there was a point when I was walking, stumbling down Hollywood Boulevard in my rags with no shoes on stinking of alcohol and unshaved, and I looked up at the marquee, and there's a movie with my name over the title. Then I'd walk down the street, and a few buildings later I'd see another movie that I'm in. There were three movies playing on the same block, and I'm in all of them. And here I am, this raging alcoholic looking like a homeless man. Nobody would know if they ran into me that I was actually a guy who was starring in all these movies. As an actor, he was brilliant. He had such a dynamic performance in everything he did sometimes to the extreme. Jack would go on to struggle with alcoholism, and he passed in 1996 after an assault at a Hollywood donut shop. That left him with a black eye, and after complaining about headaches to some friends, he was found on his bathroom floor the next day due to internal injuries. And uh, I attended his uh, remembrance, and, and there was a lot of very important men there, and David Lynch was there because of a racer head. And, and he spoke on behalf of Jack, and he told the most amazing story, which I'll never do justice, but I'll try and say very quickly, was uh, David was returning from a shoot which brought him down Lincoln Boulevard at the time that the sun is coming up, dawn. It was a night shoot, and David's simply driving home. So by the time David is actually uh, driving down, the sun's been up for a couple hours, and it's probably around 7.30. And... There's a liquor store on the corner, and there's Jack Nance sitting in front of the liquor store. And the liquor store is closed. It doesn't open for whatever time it is, another 30 minutes or so. David stops the car, the, w the way he recounted the story at the eulogy. He goes over to Jack and says, Jack, what are you doing? I need a drink. Said, what, what could be possibly go so bad in your life that you have to start your day with a drink? In my apartment building... A pipe broke, and all the water's running out. Well, just, just call the building manager and have him attend to it. I am the building manager. <laughs> Before us all, thanks to Jack, there remains a lifetime on film that can be referred to as such not by time spent making films, but by the magic Jack Nance left behind. 